Okay, welcome back everyone. Today we're taking a look at the Italian Fucile Modello 1938. In English, that is the Rifle Model 1938, or simply the Carcano Model 38. This rifle was developed right before the outbreak of World War II and has interesting history of being a logistical failure for the Italian military, despite some great improvements over its predecessor. And it's also infamous for later being used in the future assassination of a US president. This particular rifle made its way to Finland during World War II as purchased war aid from Italy. This is, of course, one variant of a very large family of Carcano rifles, starting with the Fucile Modello 1891 or Model 1891 long rifle, adopted by the Italian government in 1892. The Carcano family of rifles would serve as the basis for all Italian military rifles for 50 years up until the very end of World War II. Now this Model 38 is chambered in the 7.35 by 51 millimeter rimless cartridge, weighs 8.1 pounds by itself, that's of course without the bayonet, has a barrel length of uh, about 21.10 inches, has a total length of 40.2 inches, and has a muzzle velocity of around 2,400 feet per second. Now turning it around, we see that it's fitted for a side mounted sling, has an underfolding short blade bayonet that we'll take a look at in a few minutes, has uh, fixed sights, Internally, it has a Monlicker style loading system that holds six cartridges in a metallic end block clip, as we see here. And it pretty much shares the same bolt system that all Carcano family rifles have that was developed by Salvatore Carcano. And this is who we get the rifle's namesake from. Now, before I jump into the history of this rifle, I want to note that the Model 38 was developed in two different calibers. Originally the 7.35 millimeter and then the 6.5 millimeter Carcano cartridges. And this change was made for logistical reasons that I'll explain in just a minute. Now during the Great War, or World War I as we Americans call it, the main long arm of the Italian military was the model of rifle 1891. And this rifle was of course chambered in the 6.5 Carcano cartridge. And in the same fashion, most other world powers at the time used long rifles that predated the Great War by over 20 years. Many of these World War I era rifles, the Gewehr 98, the Gewehr 88, the Lee Enfield, were pretty much designed in the 1890s with the idea of long range engagements and rank and order firing rather than what we actually end up seeing in World War I, which was short distance trench combat. During the war, and of course after the war ended, many militaries seeing that combat distances were shrinking, began shortening or adopting shorter rifles as their main infantry arms. Why have these very long, awkward, and heavy rifles when you anticipate battlefield engagements of no more than 500 yards? And the Italian armed forces were no different. During the interwar period, many of these 1891 long rifles here were cut and shortened down to musketoon length rifles, such as this Moschetto Modello 1891-24, as it was designated. And then new musketoon length rifles were manufactured starting in 1928, based off of older World War I musketoon designs, but you know, with a few cosmetic differences. This is actually an 1891 long rifle that was simply cut down after the war. You can tell by the longer rear sights here, but um, generally militaries were moving towards shorter length rifles for their main infantry units. Now the Italian armed forces had wanted to design and adopt an all new standard issue rifle for their military since the end of World War I, but the decision to refurbish old rifles like the 24s, instead of adopting a new one was due to lack of available economic resources and other military priorities at the time. But with the Italian invasion of Abyssinia in 1935 and its involvement in the Spanish Civil War, there was renewed interest in small arms research and development. During the Ethiopian campaigns, they found that the 6.5 millimeter cartridge was relatively underpowered compared to its European competitors at the time, especially at intermediate distances. We're talking the eight millimeter Mauser, uh, the American 30-06, uh, of course the British 303, and uh, artillery major Robert Borgin, I apologize if I mispronounce that, then ordered the creation of a new rifle in an improved caliber, and this gave birth to the 7.35 millimeter cartridge, whose development was overseen by Colonel Giuseppe Maianardi. At first, many of the older 1891 long rifles were converted to this new 7.35 cartridge, with the only change being the barrel and chamber size. They quickly found out, however, that the gain barrel twist in these original 1891s deformed the 7.35 bullet as it was traveling through the barrel, and so a finely tuned rifle for this new cartridge was needed. Now putting aside these older rifles for a second, Italy was fairly confident in its new military design. They officially produced the Fucile Modello 1938, which was lighter more compact than what other European powers were using at the time. 
Actually, it's a little bit shorter than what most other European powers were using at the time, so this meant it was easier to carry and maneuver with, and it was an all-around more comfortable rifle. Additionally, it had a new, harder-hitting cartridge, but it's still less so than, say, the German 8mm Mauser and the American 30 out 6 This meant that the reduced weight of the rifle didn't result in excessive recoil for the shooter, especially for conscripted soldiers who may have not as much experience with firearms as um, soldiers of, let's say, Germany or Britain. Also, it had simplified fixed sights, like we said earlier, which was largely a cost-saving measure. It had a preset aim of 200 meters, and you're pretty much good to go at this range. But most importantly, they kept the same bolt and mon liquor style loading system as an economic savings measure. So still a Carcano at the end of the day, just with a larger makeover. All in all, this was a fairly straightforward, pretty utilitarian rifle. It was rugged, dependable, and most importantly to the Italian government, it was inexpensive, and it was something that every soldier could learn to use. Now, the original 6.5 Carcano cartridge, which we see here, has a lot of advantages. The idea behind its design was to keep barrel erosion at a minimum, and this was achieved by keeping the powder charge at a modest level. This meant less maintenance was needed on barrels in the future, and it kept costs down. With a muzzle velocity of 2,270 feet per second in the 1891 long rifle, it packed a punch at a short to medium ranges and was relatively stable at long distances. Additionally, the original Carcano barrel was designed with gain twist rate rifling, and this added to the fact that the 6.5 Carcano cartridge has a long nose shaped bullet, like we see here, gives the bullet a higher ballistic coefficient, which means more stability and a flat trajectory in the air. The problem with this is that a lighter and small diameter bullet passing through a target is less likely to create the internal havoc and stopping power that a wider bullet might create. Ideally, you want to leave a larger wound channel than a smaller one in a target. In an ironic sense, it was a more humane bullet. Now, the 7.35 millimeter cartridge that we see here was created by increasing the bullet size of the 6.5 millimeter to, of course, 7.35 millimeters and giving it a semi-spitzer shape, as you can obviously see, which is closer to the familiar 30 caliber or larger diameter bullets used by the United States, Britain, and Germany. Now, the reason they didn't increase the size of the bullet to 8mm or even fully adopt the larger 8mm Mauser cartridge was because the one modest size increase of 7.35 allowed them to recycle existing stockpiles of 6.5 barrels to convert them to the new cartridge. Like we said before, cost, keeping costs low was everything for this project. And two, because a more powerful cartridge and a lighter and shorter barrel had more recoil than what the army had wanted. Like we said earlier, they did pretty much everything possible to keep production costs low and reuse whatever parts they could from old rifles in the production of the 38s. In addition to a wider bullet diameter, obviously 7.35 is wider than 6.5, the tip of the bullet had an aluminum core sitting on top of a lead base. And because lead is more dense than aluminum, the shift in the center of gravity would create a more unstable bullet when impacting the target. Therefore, the target will end up with a rather unpleasant wound that has a wider and harder to patch up impact area. With the Model 38, the 7.35 reached an average muzzle velocity of 2,480 feet per second. Ballistically, it's similar to 3030 Winchester, and had the Italian army been able to mass produce this in time for the war, it would have likely produced some nastier outcomes on the battlefield. Now, changing your entire production system for a new cartridge requires a large investment in time and money. With this cartridge being officially adopted in 1938 and Italy's entry into World War II in 1940, it wasn't long until Italy had to stop the production of rifles chambered in the 7.35 because the new rifle and cartridge couldn't keep up with wartime demand. They had a much larger supply of guns in 6.5 and ammunition for those guns that had been stockpiled for over 40 years, while barely having two years to stockpile the 7.35. Two years sounds like a long time, but when you're in the middle of a war, um, ammunition goes extremely quickly. You also run into a problem where your armed forces are having to be supplied with two different types of ammunition, which creates a whole set of logistical issues. If you have an entire front line mixed with 7.35 and 6.5 rifles, it could create a pretty bad situation if ammunition logistics got messed up. You just don't want to risk that. 
However, this was not the end of the Model 38. In fact, they continued producing these in factories well into the 1940s since they were already set up with all the equipment and infrastructure to produce this rifle. They were, however, refitted to produce them in the older 6.5 cartridge, and they actually produced more of them in 6.5 than 7.35 by a pretty wide margin. Now, what do you do with all these 7.35 rifles that you really don't want to send to the front line, but you still want to go towards some practical use? You're in a war, you need rifles. Well, rear guard units were equipped with these, such as coastal defense batteries, anti-aircraft crews, some were given to Italian units on the Eastern Front, but a large number of these were shipped to Finland, about 95,000 of them, one of which is this rifle here. Now, to give you guys the context around the Finnish connection here, Finland was invaded by the Soviet Union in 1939 in what was called the Winter War, and Finland was basically trying to get their hands on any weapons they could purchase from abroad. This, of course, included 95,000 of these M38s that Italy was more than happy to get rid of. So, while most of these rifles didn't arrive in Finland until after hostilities ceased in 1940 between, of course, Finland and the Soviet Union, Finland participated in the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, called Operation Barbarossa by the Germans, and is uh, referred to as the Continuation War in Finland. So they were still put to use, uh, the M38s were of course still put to use. During this whole period, Finland issued the rifles to many second line units, civilian militias, anti-aircraft units, reconnaissance units, and other such roles since the ammunition wasn't as widely available for them. Again, they ran into the same logistical issues that Italy did. They just, there wasn't a ton of ammunition to go around. So, you know, it's just one of those things where if you can have rifles and you have some ammunition with them, you can still put them to use. You're just not gonna put them to your frontline units that are gonna be using and expending a lot of ammo. Now what you'll generally see is that the Finnish Mark 38s are generally in decent condition just because they didn't see a lot of combat, but that doesn't mean they weren't used at all. And some frontline infantry units in Finland put them to use um, until Finland's negotiated peace with the Soviet Union in 1944, which put them out of the war. And I also don't wanna create the misconception that the Italians didn't use these either because the Italians did put these to good use, especially during the Allied invasion of Italy during 1943. Now to go off that point, based on first-hand accounts, people who were scouts or doing active reconnaissance liked them because of their lightness and compactness, but the general behavior was to kind of ditch them when you could get your hands on a most Nagant since the Finns and Soviets used the same ammunition in their rifles, which, you know, for logistical reasons makes a lot of sense. I'll also note here that in the last two years of the war, a limited number of 38s were reworked to accept the German 8mm Mauser cartridge just out of pure reliance on German supply lines, as much of the northern half of Italy was under German occupation. This short-lived Italian Social Republic was set up in German-occupied Italy, more or less a powerless puppet government, but they did have an official army that fought alongside Germany, despite Italy's fascist government capitulating in 1943. After World War II, this rifle fell into relative obscurity, especially ones that were chambered in 7.35. The 6.5 and the 7.35 just weren't cartridges that would have been widely available in U.S. stores at the time, so interest really wasn't there for U.S. hunters and shooters. Um, don't wanna forget Canada, too. They also got a large number of surplus weapons. However, in the 1950s, Finland wholesale sold their entire 7.35 Carcanos on the surplus market, so most of these made their way to the US and Canada. This particular rifle, it's safe to assume, followed that same path. Now, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, Italy had mostly phased out the use of Carcanos in their post-World War II military, so they did the same thing with their national stockpile of Carcanos that Finland did. They sold them to the U.S. surplus market, which was basically an endless pit of shooters, collectors, firearms enthusiasts who were happy to take them in bulk. This includes a large number of Model 38s chambered in 6.5. Pretty much all of those came from Italy. The ones in 7.35 came from both Italy and Finland. Um, you know, one such rifle ended up in the hands of one Lee Harvey Oswald, who on November 22nd, 1963, fired three shots from his Model 38 from the Texas School Book Repository in Dallas, Texas at President John F. Kennedy's motorcade, mortally wounding him. While the rifle I'm holding right now is not in the same caliber used to assassinate JFK, it stands as a good example of an imported surplus market Model 38 from that era. 
Now, Oswald mail-ordered his rifle from a February 1963 edition of the American Rifleman magazine, picked out from a typical page advertisement from this time. Klein Sporting Goods Company, based in Chicago, featured a whole page of military surplus firearms advertised for use by hunters. This is the particular ad he responded to, and it was simply advertised as a 6.5 Italian carbine with a four power scope for only $19.95. Adjusted for inflation, this is about $178 in 2021. Klein took a number of these rifles and fitted them with telescopic sights made by a company called Ordnance Optics. As an interesting aside to this whole episode, Kleins had acquired their supply of 6.5 Carcanos from New York City-based company Crescent Firearms Inc., which worked in conjunction with their sister company, Adams Consolidated Industries, to buy and import rifles from abroad. In 1958, the Italian military put up their stockpile of rifles for auction to half a dozen arms importers from the U.S. and Canada, and Adams Consolidated Industries ended up with about a half a million rifles after the auction ended at $2.70 a piece. The assassination rifle was subsequently shipped to New York Harbor from Italy in 1960 during one of several large shipments. For those of you who are actually interested in the long form story and arrangements around the post-war import of these Carcano rifles, I'll leave a link in the description below. Now, notice that the picture does not show a Model 38. Instead, it shows a Moschetto Modelo 1891-1924, which were, of course, cut down 1891 long rifles, which we had talked about earlier, and you can obviously tell by the longer rear adjustable sights. And what is interesting, however, is that Klein sent Oswald a rifle different from the one shown in the picture. Obviously, they sent him a Model 38, which was slightly longer than the 24s. This was because when Kleins put in an order for more rifles from Crescent Firearms Inc. in April 1963, they had run out of their supply of 9124 Moschetto rifles shown in the February advertisement. So they shipped Oswald a slightly longer Model 38 rifle. You know, unfortunately, the assassination left a really bad taste for Carcanos in the mouths of sportsmen and shooters of that era. So it was seen as sort of a cheap killer's weapon. However, contemporary enthusiasts are reversing that negative connotation as new collectors have taken up an interest in Carcano rifles. So with that being said, let's go ahead and take a close-up look at this rifle in particular. Looking at the barrel here, we see it marked RE Turney, which was one of the state-operated small arms arsenals located in Turney, Italy. Turney produced about 246,000 of the M38s chambered in 7.35 from 1938 to 1940. They were also manufactured by Brescia, Beretta, and uh, Gordon Valtrumpia. Throughout the two-year period, they made these rifles in 7.35 for a production total of 295,000. When they switched over to producing them in 6.5, they only manufactured them from 1940 to 1941 for a total of 660,000. So overall, they actually made more of these in 6.5 than they did in 7.35, and for obvious reasons. On the right side of the barrel here, we see 1939, which is, of course, the production year. A notable point is that we see next to the production year, 1939, is an XVII in Roman numerals, which is 17. This means it was manufactured 17 years after the start of the fascist era in Italy when, in October 1922, Mussolini led the fascists on a march on Rome. On the left side of the barrel, we of course see the firearm serial number, and then above that we see this curious SA right here in a box. This is a Finnish Army acceptance mark. And then below this we see the oval crest of the House of Savoy, or the symbol of the Italian royal family. One final thing that I wanted to point out, but if you look at the barrel on the 38, you'll notice that it is cylindrical, which was common for rifles produced from 1936 onwards, while earlier manufactured ones going back to the 1890s, like this 9124 here, were faceted or square-shaped like this. Right here we see that fixed rear sight that we were referencing earlier, which is a deviation from previous Carcano designs, which were adjustable. It's automatically set for 200 meters, and this meant less training was involved, but it was really just to simplify the manufacturing process and save on production costs. As Ian McCollum pointed out in another video, it wasn't an assumption that the average soldier wasn't intelligent enough to adjust their sights, it was just a practicality thing. Above the sight notch is the caliber of the rifle, 7.35 outline pretty well because they did make these in two different calibers. Easy for someone to get confused if it's not pointed out directly. 
Now the receiver, except for this small inspector's mark and a few marks underneath the wood here, is pretty much blank. Now one of the design elements that did not change from previous Carcano rifles was the loading, firing, and safety system. To load, a six round end block clip is charged into the magazine. Pull the bolt back there and you've got your six round end block clip. It will be charged into the magazine, pushing against an elevator spring until you hear a click from the clip latch holding the end block clip in place. The tension from the elevator spring will push the next round up as it's ready to be guided into the receiver. Once the final round is chambered, the empty clip will simply fall out of the magazine through a hole in the bottom. From here, the empty magazine is recharged with a fresh end block clip and the shooter is ready with six new cartridges. And this can be loaded fairly quickly. The Carcano utilizes a tube style safety, which means it's built into the bolt itself rather than having it externally. So when the bolt is in the cocked position, as you can see here, you apply pressure to the thumb piece and you move it to the left, which decompresses the firing pin spring, making it impossible to fire. The thumb piece also blocks the soldier's sight of line, indicating that it's in a safe position. As you can see here, if you try to look down the sights, this rear sight would be entirely blocked from the firing position. To disengage the safety, you move it forward and to the right, where the firing pin is now under the pressure of the spring and is ready to fire. The stocks of the M38s were either made of beechwood or ash. It has two pieces, the upper handguard and the main stock, and you'll also see that the M38 has these finger grooves along the sides for easy gripping. The upper handguard is held in place by the front band here, which has a sideways sling swivel. Now I'll note here that this is the most common type of front band, which is held in place by two screws and gives it a little more support. Initial production 38s were fitted with just one screw bands and the top handguard was extended all the way up to the front. And these, of course, are much more scarce to find. Also, looking at the front, you'll see this slot underneath the fore end of the wood here, which is a place where a removable folding bayonet would fit. And then, of course, you have the bayonet lug along the barrel channel. Taking a look at the buttstock, we see the sling loop here. And then we would normally see an arsenal cartouche here, the caliber repeated, and then a serial number repeated. But this stock was refinished at some point, so all three of those were scrubbed. The buttstock is obviously protected by a metal butt plate and has a trap door right here which houses a breakdown cleaning rod. I don't have an example to show you, but this is where it would go. And this is a deviation from other Carcano models which had their cleaning rods stored in the underbelly of the stock. A quick note about the bayonet, but it's pretty simple to use. You have a push-in button here that allows it to swivel 180 degrees freely as so. And I'll just put it on the plug for a second. can be a little finicky if I can get it aligned there. So yeah, again, you've got this button that allows it to swing 180 degrees freely to either fold into the stock when it's not used, so you can see where it comes in handy for that forend, or you can move it in place to keep it fixed forward. Later in the war, these were issued and um, there were a lot of complaints that the blade would come free during combat or wouldn't stay in place. So they replaced them with a simple forward fixed bayonet that didn't have the ability to swivel. This is a reproduction of the original bayonet from Atlanta Cutlery and it's a nice example. But uh, yeah, you can kind of see what it would look like on both sides and then when not in use. it would just tuck away. Now overall, this is an incredibly smooth rifle and I really enjoy how it feels and shoots. You could see totally why the Italian military uh, wanted to create something that wasn't bulky, was easy to shoulder, was easy to use for the average person. Um, but I really liked my experience with this rifle and I'll definitely be taking it out to shoot. Um, relatively soon, 7.35 millimeter Carcano ammo is not the easiest to find, um, especially right now, but it is available from time to time. The information I used for this video mainly comes from the book, The Model 1891 Carcano Rifle, A Detailed Development and Production History. I'll leave a link to this book in the video description as a reference. 
If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.